Kyle. Uh, yes. I had the craziest dream last night. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Lay it on me. I was in the Billingsgate Fish Market. Okay. Um, but I wasn't really there with the plan. I was just there auto skeetiastically. Okay. <laughs> and I walked past this pig pen full of scrofulous pigs. No. No, you didn't. <laughs> And they were, I mean, they were just huge. They were picnic pigs. Oh, my God. And then a black hole opened up in the sky and just <laughs> spaghettified everybody. Emily, so if, is there, can I cancel this podcast? I mean, I can because I've almost canceled us so many times. I realized I can't really add anything after everybody's been sucked into a black hole. So yeah, know, it's, it's fair. Yeah. It's, it's done. <laughs> Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Kyle Imperator and Emily Moyers take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey, uh, everybody. Hey, my name's Kyle. This is Emily. We're here for Butter No Parsnips. Uh, we hope you're here for Butter No Parsnips as well. Yes, you should be. Otherwise, you might be in the wrong place, but you should stick around anyway, because we're going to have a yes. grand old time. And that grand old time is going to start with a word. <gasps> a word? Emily, you ready wow. for my word? I don't know if I'm ready for this word, but I'm going to I'm gonna just take life as it comes. That's That's a good way to take life. Um, right. And maybe with a glass of water. That's a good way to take life as well. Oh, that's true. So your word today, Emily, is tantivy. Tantivy? Tantivy. T-A-N-T-I-V-Y. Tantivy. I was not expecting a Y at the end there. <laughs> yeah, it's been spelled multiple ways, but that's the way that stuck. Okay. I mean, I don't think this is the answer, but my immediate thought is this has to be like... A dance from Russia or somewhere in, like, northeastern Europe. The Tantivy. The Tantivy. Yeah, it sounds like a fad dance from, like, Pennsylvania. <laughs> or, like, some big uh, uh, obscure drum that's, like, at the back of the orchestra. Oh, that's interesting. Why do you say that? Why do you ask that? Am I close? <laughs> no, uh... No, but I'm interested oh. where you where you draw the line there. It just it sounds like timpani or other obscure drums. Well, I'll say this. There is a main definition for this word, like in a main etymology. There's some extra etymologies, one of which we won't get into. Maybe no. that'll be for an after hours episode. Exclusive late night content. Exclusive late night content, butter hey, parsnips. Hey, we're Plug in the Patreon, always. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the s extra definitions is musical related. But that's not going to help you get the main definition at all. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. So I should just ignore that then? <laughs> yes. So, I mean, let me get let me get here. It is a noun? That's a great question. This word can be used in the following ways. Adverb, adjective, noun, verb. Or interjection. Interjection? Yes, you can. <laughs> you can just shout Tantivy? Yes, you can. And in fact, it's one of the more relatively popular ways to use that word. As well as every other part of speech? <laughs> yeah, I, I think adverb is the most popular. No. Yeah. No? Yes, yeah. Oh my god. A ten so, so, an adverb... Describing an adjective or describing a verb? A verb. Oh, oh so <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I know what? it's a rough one. Ask me. Ask me what the origin is. I was gonna ask. What is yeah. the language of origin? We don't know. Kyle, you're a nightmare. <laughs> we don't know, but it's probably English. Okay. I can I ask like, how how modern is it? So the earliest instance of it comes from the 17th century. God, I just have no idea, Kyle. What on <laughs> earth does it mean? So here's tantivy. So the definition of tantivy, I'll give you the adverb definition, because yeah. that seems to be the most famous one. 
means at full gallop or full tilt, or with great speed, as in to ride Tantivy. To ride Tantivy. Yeah. Wow. As, you know, on a horse or... Yeah, they didn't. Like, they didn't have like, motorcycles in the 17th century, but I, I imagine sure. if they did, they would describe that as well. Yeah, yeah, that would be. You have to say it with a different inflection. You'd have to say to ride Tantivy. <laughs> to ride Tantivy. That would be the name of the motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, with a Tantivy gang. Yeah, and it could be used as all those other forms of speech as well as an adjective. It just means I mean swift. I, I need you to give me a sample sentence for all of those parts of speech because this okay, is bonkers. So, <laughs> so as an adjective, it means swift, hasty, or on the rush. So you could say... Like a Tantivy horse? Yeah. No, I, that, that that's probably the best way to, to describe. It. Yes. A Tantivy horse. Or, or Tantivy travel? Yeah. Yes. I'm trying to think of other ways that you could do it, but I'm coming up with adverbs too. <laughs> as a noun... Uh, it means a rapid gallop or ride, an impetuous rush or torrent, or top speed. So if you could describe the way that I've mo- I'm moving as Tantivy, you could say that the actual journey that I made was a Tantivy. This is bonkers. Yeah, so like if I if it's if I'm uh, me on my on my stallion riding across the plains, you could say, ah, he's on his Tantivy to Houston or whatever. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but also an interjection. Uh, but also an interjection and a verb. And a verb. I forgot. You could say I tantivied. I tantivied away. He's tantivying. Oh you could say that. And it's an interjection. So just if someone rides by very quickly, you go, oh, tantivy. <laughs> hey, tantivy. <laughs> it's like when you see like a beetle, like a like a Volkswagen bug, and you got to announce it or something like that. Um, yeah, no. yeah you, you punch the roof and go, tantivy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, actually, so the interjection definition gets to the meat of what we're going to be talking about today. So, okay. Tantivy as an interjection is used as a hunting cry, inciting oh speed or denoting full chase. So, if you're screaming Tantivy, it mean you're you're either telling the other hunters it's let's like, go fast, or ho, you're silver. just yeah, or you're just already going fast and you're excited about it. Kyle, I hate that this is every part of speech. This I know, is, this I is know. stressing me out so I know. much, <laughs> and I love it so much, and I've got so much good content for you, Emily, and I'm so oh excited. Oh my god. <laughs> Um, so it's, it also shows up in Webster's 1913 dictionary. There's a word tivy, meaning with great speed, but it, yeah. I've never seen it anywhere else. So I think it might just have been an abbreviation at some point or maybe a mistake. I don't know. But we don't know the origin of this word. It has no wow. meaning. The best that we have a guess for is that it's probably onomatopoeic for the sound of a galloping horse's hooves. That's the best we got. Sure, I guess a little bit. <laughs> I guess. Well, think of like 17th century onomatopoeias. You know, they probably yeah. didn't say that dogs barked. They probably say that said that they, I don't know, persnoodled. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a horse tantivies. Wow. Gosh. And and you said the the 1600s. Yep. Is like so the earliest. The earliest written use that we have of it is from a 1641 play by an English dramatist named Richard Brome. The play was called A Jovial Crew. Uh, And here is the quote from that play that uses Tantivy. It's a paraphrasing because it's a long sentence. Up at five o'clock in the morning and out till dinner time and Tantivy all the country over where hunting, hawking or any sport is to be made or good fellowship to be had. (laughs) <laughs> what a what a jaunty man. <laughs> what a jaunty man and a very jaunty word. Tantivy is Absolutely. an extremely jaunty word about it's the jauntiest word about the jauntiest of uh topics. So yes. so Tantivy is a hunting term, Emily, and yeah. we're going to talk about hunting terms today. Do, are do you have any familiarity with hunting? Cuz I did not before going into this. I mean, I I feel like I've seen like hunting scenes in period shows. Yes, this is hunting as the sport, not hunting as 
whatever it's it the most dangerous it game in. yes yeah <laughs> not as in that although i would i would argue that could be a sport too <laughs> <laughs> no but like 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 well-to-do rich people in yes the you know old olden times in in the olden times yes yeah yeah i mean yeah. i think the most that i know is what i've seen from period tv and you know it's funny i was looking through a um database that had um like scripts tv and movie scripts in it and tan tv came up in like a bunch of old period movies yeah. like in the script like that was the only place that i could find it in media <laughs> so yeah so to research these hunting terms emily i found an 1823 dictionary by English <gasps> sporting writer John Badcock under the pseudonym John B. Um, and like many books of the time, this uh, book has, you know, we've talked about it so so often, but this book has the most insane run-on sentence for its title page. Are <laughs> yes. you ready for this? Are you ready for I this? I am Emily? so ready. It's the okay. best thing about all books. <laughs> it's, it's so great. So the title of this book is Slang, period. A dictionary of the turf, the chase, the pit, of Bonton, and the varieties of life, forming the completest and most authentic lexicon balatronicum hitherto offered to the notice of the sporting world, for elucidating words and phrases that are necessarily or purposely cramp, mutative, and unintelligible outside their respective spheres, period. Interspersed with anecdotes and whimsies, with tart quotations and rum ones, with examples, proofs, and monitory precepts, useful and proper for novices, flats, and yokels. <laughs> that is the full title we, of this dictionary. We fall under the yokel category. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Kyle, what was that word you hit towards the... I would say the, the first third of that. that was, was it like lexicon bar- balatronicum? Yes, I wish you could see the face I made when you read that word. <laughs> I'm I I am so glad that our producer is doing research for us today because I did not look that word up. But it turns out that a lexicon balatronicum is a dictionary of buckish slang, university wit, and pickpocket eloquence. Hey there, it's Seth, the producer in question. And while I'm with you, it's totally insane that Kyle heard the word balatronicum and brushed right over it. I should have been there to highlight to him that this word is, indeed, wild. I only have myself to blame, but I've instructed him to revisit the word on an exclusive Patreon episode of Buttered Parsnips, and that should be out now at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. Please forgive me. And now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Let me explain to you those other terms. So, like, turf is horse racing. The chase is uh, hunting, which we're going to talk about today. The pit is dogfighting, and Bonton is just high life and pleasure seekers. So these are, these are all the terms that flew through in that long title. Yes. The turf, the chase, the pit. And Bonton. And Bonton. <laughs> and Bonton. So to touch on what we just touched on a little bit. Yeah. In an incredible... 14-page annotated preface to this dictionary, John B. goes through lengths to explain how meticulous he was in his research of this book, but also to prove that his literary rivals were utterly wrong. (laughs) He particularly drubs a man who we've talked much about. Oh my God! A man who is very familiar to this podcast, uh, thanks to his work on Billingsgate. Uh, and a man who we just mentioned has his own lexicon balatronicum. Oh my God. Francis Gross. Emily? I'm going to explode. <laughs> What's happening? Emily, do you remember all of those suggestions you made of Francis Gross and of his research way back when, when we did Billingsgate? I mean, that was eons past, Kyle. Yes, I know. So we're going to put Are in an auditory... Are you telling me you followed up? <laughs> I did. We're going to put in a little auditory flashback. I looked through this book at length, and a lot of the entries in it are just like, there's no way that anyone would ever say that. That's ridiculous. (laughs) And what occurred to me is that, like, Francis Gross was not of the common people, so he could have just heard 
one guy say something weird and went, yep, that must be what all the poor folk are saying. Have I been proven right? You've been is, proven. Is Mr. B backing me up? <laughs> Mr. B is backing you up. Of oh Francis God. Gross, John B says, Captain Gross was much too gross, even for his day. <laughs> Besides which, his work has become antiquated, stale, and out of date. <laughs> he continues to say that some of his work was okay, some of it was outdated, but, specifically, beyond this, a long, dreary, and extravagant waste of words and phrases, then little used, often belied, some worthless oh or worse, and a few never heard of but when the captain pronounced them, contributed to swell his book. Oh so basically he's saying God. that he was just kind of making shit up. <laughs> That's Kyle, I am elated right now. <laughs> I knew you would be stunned. I knew you would be so happy. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, Emily, Captain Gross might have been just a little bit of a liar. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> I so I there's literally so much about him and about like all of the other people who wrote slang dictionaries that john yeah. b is like just that they were just completely making shit up. <laughs> just he's like so mad about it and he goes through all of these lengths to be like i did my research i know that this is real stuff and like he's like he talks about how like gross and like someone else had like a million editions of their own work that just kind of added things that weren't even slang and he's like no, this is what slang is, and it's not just for criminals, but it's for all walks of life. It's an all-people uh, dictionary. Oh my gosh, this man yeah. is my hero. He is your hero. He is your hero, Emily. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, let's now talk about the chase. Let's talk about hunting and, and all of the terms therein that he has in his dictionary. So, John B. describes... The chase as, generally speaking, all hunting or following of animals with dogs comprises the chase. So it's hunting specifically with dogs. There's a specific type of hunting called coursing, which is hunting with greyhounds by sight and not by scent. I, oh, I guess wow. usually the chase is by scent and not by sight. Right. You use like bloodhounds. Yeah, they've got very specific terminology here. And uh, hunting can be separated by two types of venery, which are game animals. There are chase venery, which are diurnal animals. He lists red deer of antler, hare, boar, and wolf. <laughs> or there are warren, which are nocturnal animals, such as buck and doe, fox and marten. Wow. Which I assume... Steve Martin counts as one of those. <laughs> no, I think it's like a weasel type of animal. Yeah, they make like, I don't know, stoles out of Martins, right? Yeah, I think so. Something like that. B goes on to say, in France, all field sports are la chasse, and they describe the kind as la chasse au fusil for shooting la and chasse. so on. Uh, but the French are not sportsmen in any sense, whatever. <laughs> Just had to throw a little dig in there to the French. <laughs> the French ain't got no game. <laughs> yeah. They're not sportsmen. That's so funny. <laughs> so here's a fun term, Emily, that you'll love. A fun hunting term that's clearly a hunting term. Yoik! <laughs> Isn't that what um, Shaggy would shout when he was scared? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he'd scream, yoik! <laughs> like Scoob! <laughs> I'm John Yoik! <laughs> So I, you're I actually kind of you're kind of close there, Emily. Uh, a yoik is uh, to yoik. Sorry, is to cheer at the death of the chase or any other notable exploit. So basically, <laughs> if something fun happens during your hunting, you yoik. Yeah. Instead of hurrah, you yoik. You yoik. You you yoik. That's where we live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yoik. <laughs> you yoik. Yeah, yo. Welcome, you you yoik. <laughs> Oh, an alternate Scooby. <laughs> an alternate Scooby. So he describes Yoik's plural as Tantivy, a call to the hounds to keep them together or to excite attention. Wow. So Tantivy is a Yoik. No, I think Tantivy is just a rush, a flurry of action. I don't know. Maybe it also is an interject. I don't know. No, it can't be because I looked it up and the cry itself is Yoik. 
But I thought the cry itself was Tantivy. I thought you yell out Tantivy. That's a separate cry. There's so many things that they just yell out in hunting, Emily. We've got more to talk about. They just yell out stuff. Oh, so you're saying like Yoik and Tantivy would be yelled out in different circumstances. Yes. But I thought but the, you but said the line you just yell blurred. it out when you're excited, when you're having fun. You said that for yes. both of them. Well, I'm so there, there's, a, there's a specific instance to use it. And then also he follows up with, yeah, but people just yell it when, they, when things are going on <laughs> for both of them. Yeah. What? <laughs> so here's another one. This term's called re-cheat. What do you think that is? Re-cheat? Yes. So in, in hunting, it's when your hunting party catches you with another hunting party for the second <laughs> time. <laughs> Ugh. I guess now we're going to have to re re cheat and hope we'll get away with it then. <laughs> the other We've learned go, nothing. Just scream <laughs> yoik and get over with it. <laughs> um, no, Emily, a re cheat is a blast upon the horn to call or keep the hunters together. Oh. So it's like to gather them up. If you've ever played Pikmin, it's like gathering the Pikmin together is a re cheat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are at least eight different calls used in the recheat, and when used on a hunting horn, the parts of the call are called tons and tavans. I assume it's ton, tavan, tavan, ton. That's my guess. Yes, but there's yes. not there's, a lot about that stuff. There's a similar term in drumming, and I want to say it's ton tiki or something very similar. Oh, ton tiki. Maybe ton, that's where you got your ton, timpani. Tip, mm, I can't remember. But it's it's like the word for whether you're hitting, like doing a big hit in the middle of the drum or shorter sure. hits on the edge of the drum. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I, the horn has that as well. The hunting horn is as well. Tons and tabons. And so here's B's definition of tantivy. Let's get to that now. Yeah. So yeah. we talked about how tantivy plays into some of the other definitions. Tantivy is described as an invitation to the field, as in, and then, so this is a little quote that he has. He's got a couple yeah. quotes in the Tantivy section. This quote is, While health gives new charms to the sport of field, Tantivy, my boys, let's away. <laughs> that's his definition. Yeah, that's what you'd say when yeah. you're hunting. Tantivy, then, my boys. Let's away. Then he says, wow. Tantivy can also be an answer to all kinds of objections. <laughs> And then, and then he quotes this, cries Jane, Dear John, avoid the snare that lurks in yonder field. Yoikes, Tantivy, Soho. Ah, oh John, cries Jane, if life's your care, of Tantivy, oh, beware. I don't even know I what that means at this point. <laughs> I don't think John or Jane knows what Tantivy means. <laughs> Yoikes, Tantivy, Soho. <laughs> You're just throwing out syllables. None of these it's are words. just yelling stuff. So then he he follows up with a third thing and he says, but also tantivy can mean properly certain notes upon the horn called tantavon. <laughs> and I don't know if that means that like one of the calls in the recheat is called a tantivy. Or like it, said, it has the same emotional, you know, meaning as tantivy. Uh, perhaps. Well, then he, no, because then he says it is very frequently employed in the recheat and upon the death of animals. The Tantavon. So this brings me, Emily, to a whole nother era of Tantivy knowledge. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Are you ready for this? It's, it is, it is just, I am <laughs> flooded in Tantivies right now. <laughs> it seems that Tantivy at some point in time was confused with a very similar word. Oh no. And that word is Tantara. <laughs> T-A-N-T-A-R-A. It could be Tantara or Tantara, depending yeah. on your, you know, accent at the time. Yeah. It, th- that word, Tantara, means the blare of a trumpet or horn. Sure. It's also been used as Tarantara, Taratantara. I've seen it as a tarantula. verb. Tarantula. Yeah, a tarantula. <laughs> um, I've seen it as a verb. Taratantarize means to imitate the sound of a trumpet. That's so good. <laughs> Tara Tantarize, yeah. But then he he talks about Tantara or Tantara separately. And he says that it was changed to Tantaran or Tantaran for sake of the liquid R from Tantavon. It was changed to Tantaran 
for sake of the liquid R, I guess just because it, like, felt better under their tongue to get rid of the V and use the R. I don't know. I tried looking into liquid R's, and it's different than the rhotic R, and it's just, it's, I can't take all of that information in my brain right now. (laughs) <laughs> he adds that after three repetitions of tantara, 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 they add a tante, which, <laughs> which I guess is so. I guess he's talking about not the words. He's talking about the the bugle call, the trumpet call. Sure, but I don't know what that is. Like I've tried to find sheet music of like hunting calls, and it's there's a it's there's a big gray area there. Of course there is. They're just horn calls. <laughs> just horn calls and on a horn that only played two notes. <laughs> so he explains that Tara is the feminine of Tehran. Okay, whatever that means. We really don't have any context for either of those, but okay. <laughs> and may have represented the lady and lord of the mansion in which the hunters caroused. Okay. I, the- I don't know why we're relating those to the horn call, but sure. To the horn call. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Then he says, or it could be older, he says, among the Celts of Ireland, Tara was the baronial castle or seat, and the large hall was, in like manner, Tara, where the lord or petty king gave audience, settled disputes, awarded justice in all a regalia, caroused his retainers after hunting, and heard music. So it might have been named after the place? I guess the hunting call might have come from the fact that in the Tara, they would play music after the hunt. Wow. So I guess what I'm learning is that old timey hunters were just wackadoo people. <laughs> they were, they were, yes. They were just like, hey, want to come up with a word for this? I, I, I we got to do, we got to name everything. I think it was just like a fraternity where they're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's come up with but a then, fun name for whatever, everything that we do. <laughs> then they were like, you want to come up with a word for this? And he said, yeah, it's going to be yeah. Maybe he, they were all just really drunk and those really were the wasted. only syllables they could get yeah. out. Like, <laughs> what's going to be the horse riding going to be? Chantivy. I'm sorry? Chantivy Tarantara. Okay, that's not the same as what you said the first time. You just use them all. All right. Yeah, that makes the most sense. So Tantara has been used in modern day instances, I guess, sort of modern, in music a lot. I've got two instances here that I know just from my personal knowledge of music. Wow. So uh, I am a big nerd. I'm a big nerd. What can I say? So say we all. So say we all. We all say Kyle's a big nerd. (laughs) (laughs) So in The Music Man, the musical, uh, the famous number 76 trombones, there's a lead up to it. And in the dialogue, Harold Hill says, for context, Harold Hill is a con man trying to sell band instruments to a town in the middle of Iowa. And he knows nothing about band instruments. So he's trying to like boost them up. And he says, and you'll see the glitter of crashing cymbals. And you'll hear the thunder of rolling drums and the shimmer of trumpets. Tantara. Wow. (laughs) Wow. So that's, yeah, I mean, that's that a, is that is a modern usage. Yeah, 1950s. Yeah. A less modern usage, but still like something that's known today in the light opera, I guess, The Pirates of Penzance by Gilbert and Sullivan. Yes. Uh, there's a chorus that the policemen sing called When the Foeman Bears His Steel. And uh, the main police chief sings like the opening line when the foeman bears his steel and between each line, the chorus of cops sing Tarantara, Tarantara, (laughs) we uncomfortable feel Tarantara. And then at the end of the chorus, they just go Tarantara, 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 Tarantara and sing a whole chorus of Tarantaras. (laughs) That's so funny. Yeah, it's fun. It's a fun number. So Tantivy and Tantara, Emily, are both words that are very entwined with music. So John B. talks a little bit about choruses and hunting songs. About hunting songs, he says, Hunting songs and such like cheerings of numbers terminate with, And a hunting we will go, we'll go, we'll go. Tantivy, my boys, let's away. Tally-ho and hark forward. (gasps) Hark forward. Hark forward. Does that first phrase remind you of any famous tune, Emily? It's it did. Can you say it again? 
And uh, hunting we will go, we'll go, we'll go. You know what it sounds like? This probably isn't what you're thinking of, but there's a poem called If I Were a One-Legged Pirate that sounds similar to that because oh. there's there's a part of that poem <laughs> where they say, like, plying the lane of the Spanish main for gold, 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 something like that. I mean, it is not related to that, but <laughs> I love that. That and was what I was thinking of. I'm going to I'm going to take that with me, put in a little locket, keep it around my yep. neck. <laughs> yep, look up that poem. It's very cute. Yeah, I'm going to look that up. No, actually there's a well-known folk song called A Hunting We Will Go. I'll sing oh. a few. A hunting we will go, a hunting we will go. <gasps> the, the hi ho the Dario, a hunting we will go. Uh, sure, yeah. The actual original Lyrics for that were, a hunting we will go, a hunting we will go, we'll catch a fox and put him in a box, a hunting we will go, <laughs> which is just crazy. That's hilarious. But that folk song was written by a man named Thomas Arne. He was adapting a famous ballad opera, The Beggar's Opera, by John Gay uh, in 1777, and he wrote just a new tune for it, A Hunting We Will oh, Go, wow. and that became just well known later on. Yeah. Um, ironically, Emily, I found out that The Beggar's Opera may have been inspired by Richard Brome's A Jovial Crew, which, if you remember, <laughs> is the play that had the first instance of Tantivy in it. Oh, my gosh. And even crazier. Everything circles back. Even crazier. Similarly, it seems that the Beggar's Opera then might have inspired an adaptation of The Jovial Crew into a ballad opera form in 1731. Wow. Yeah, like an Ouroboros of hunting. Yeah, it's like there's there's only one play, but there's yeah. actually a million. So yeah, there's a popular arrangement of that tune called A Hunting Scene. I say popular. It's not played anymore, <laughs> ever. But I think it was popular in like the 1800s and maybe the early 1900s. Uh, definitely which the is, early 1900s, because I've got an instance of that. Which is when we live mentally. Yes, we, we live in... Yes, exactly. <laughs> I assume I'm going to die in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that that arrangement is called a hunting scene. It's been attributed to either the British Italian light music composer Ernest Bucolossi or his father Procida Bucolossi. We don't know because they both sign their names just Bucolossi. <laughs> <laughs> so we just kind of have to guess. Sure. But that piece employs a section of hunting horn calls played by a solo cornet that are then echoed by the first cornet, either muted or played in the distance. So, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, and then in the distance, turn it, turn it, turn it. That's so funny. And there's even crazier I hope things. That it's not muted. They just have to stand. Like, they just have to in, stand. Well, in the next actually, building. <laughs> but actually, Emily, so it. It's, I don't know if it says specifically in it or if this is something that people have just done. They've done it where the cor the first cornet player is just in the distance. That's so funny. He's just like out in the lobby of the auditorium. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. There's other really interesting like things in the music that it tells the instrumentalists to do. It asks them to sing in certain places. It asks them to sing the tune. Wow. And it tells them to shout tally-ho. It has them crack <gasps> whips. It has them imitate horses galloping. That's it so has good. it has them make bird calls. And there's an even so much a part ask. where it just says bark. Bark. And it just has the instrumentalists who aren't playing bark. That's hilarious. Is it, it all is hilarious. all of those instructions are for the cornet player or just various no, for players? various instruments? For various, for usually it's just for whoever's not playing at the time. Right. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. So to close our discussion of Tantivy, here is a description for you of this piece of a hunting scene. It's a okay. description from the Merced Sun Star about the Merced concert band's performance in 1922. The birds awaken and by their caroling proclaim the advent of the day. The huntsman looks to his steed and prepares for the pleasures of the chase. We jump in the saddle and our huntsman sounds a merry blast. A hunting we will go, a hunting we will go, a hunting we will go, a hunting we will go. Tantivy, 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 a hunting we will go. Tantivy, 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 a hunting we will go. Full cry. The death. We return home. 
A hunting we will go. A hunting we will go. A hunting we will go. <laughs> Rapturous applause. Finn, the story of Tantivy. <laughs> I just love how abrupt it was. <laughs> It's like, just, like so cry. much fanfare the death. of them like, walking we on stage, <laughs> just the death, and then equivalent fanfare of them walking off stage, and that's it. I imagine that's what hunting is like, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, we got it. Okay. But we like, go home now. That's just so funny. <laughs> like, like at least in real hunting, there's like a thrill of like making the kill. But on yes. stage, it's literally just we walked out and we walked back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there, there uh, are recordings of this piece on YouTube. I found a recording. So give incredible. it a listen. Give it a listen. I'm gonna for yeah. sure. It's fun. And the sheet music is available on IMSLP. What a great resource. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Tantivy Soho. Yoik's Tantivy Soho, Emily. <laughs> Yoik's Tantivy Soho. I mean, uh, gosh, I feel like there's so many things I want to look up. I feel like I've just barely scratched the surface of understanding <laughs> the word Tantivy. Tantivy. There's so much going on here. I did so here. much research, and that's, this is the best I could come up. I, it was a point where I just had to say, you know what? This is good enough. This is what we, we're going to go with today. <laughs> Emily, yeah, do you want to play like, a little game now? <gasps> Kyle, I always want to play a little game. This game, Emily, is called That's Just Gross, B-Side. Oh my God, <laughs> Kyle. B-Side is such a good addition. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm going crazy. <laughs> So, Emily, in honor of our good friend Francis Gross, I thought we'd oh, take a look God. at some of I'm the other terms listed in B's dictionary. So shook that he has come back. <laughs> <laughs> He's back from the dead, baby. So I will read some of them, and you can see if you can guess what they mean. So that, yeah. You good for that? Okay. I'm so excited. So the first term is water bewitched. Water bewitched. Would you say a person is water bewitched? No. It's, it, this is uh, describing a thing. Is it like like poison, like animal poison? No, but that's good. No, I don't know. So, water bewitched is, this is his definition, grog too weak or tea fit only for husbands to sip. Watery, <laughs> then he goes on and says, watery chops have he or she who long for thing that is uncome attable. Uncome attable? Uncome attable. Oh, like that you is, cannot come at it? That is one word, and I had to look it up. I was like, is it uncomedable? No, it's uncomatable. <laughs> okay, your Hilarious. next one, Emily. Yeah. Your next one is plated butter. Interesting. So something is plated butter? Yes. What would what would be described as plated butter? Oh boy, I mean, I feel like this podcast is plated butter. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emily, it absolutely Definitely in a literal sense, and maybe possibly in the sense of this term. <laughs> <laughs> is plated butter like like you didn't catch anything to eat, so all we have is plated butter? No, but that's a good guess, oh. too. So he describes plated butter as that which has a good article outside, in the middle, lard and scrapings. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically something that is filled with butter but is right. given the veneer of looking like something else yes like a delectable yeah. pastry filled with nothing yes, yes. <laughs> that's fun yeah i these are these are these are good I, there were so many in this dictionary and i was like we're gonna stick to these sure this next one is a phrase and the phrase is nobody is in everybody's house nobody is in everybody's house yeah what does that mean boy i mean i feel like it just means like you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. It's just taking it very literally. It does, but for a different reason than than that. And it's, this it's a is very also funny related reason. to hunting in some way? No, or? no, no, no. Okay. This is just from elsewhere in his dictionary. Just from elsewhere Because remember that dictionary. dictionary covered everything. Right. It just, it's right. just slang. Lex lexicon. Balatronic. It, whatever. It, yeah, it, it covered the whole balatronic. <laughs> Bellatronic. And no one is in everyone's house. Is yeah, nobody is in everybody's house. Nobody is in everybody's house. 
I have not a clue, Kyle. I'm doing okay. very bad at this game. <laughs> it's okay. These are hard. So here's his his definition. Ready? When an article be missing, nobody can tell where it is. And when housemaid proves saint, and I had to look up what saint means. It means Absolutely. pregnant. It means okay. pregnant. And when the housemaid proves saint, nobody did it until she has consulted how to work the oracle. Had to look up how to work the oracle, Emily. That means to manipulate someone for personal gain. <laughs> so basically, he's saying nobody is in everybody's house means like, yeah, when something bad happens and you ask the person who did it, they say, oh, it was nobody. Until all of a sudden they need to get something from it and then they've got somebody to pin the blame on. Right. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Nope. <laughs> Every house has a nobody. Wow. I got two more for you and then a bonus, Emily. Yeah. Next one is dreams. Dreams? That's just a just word. Dreams. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think dreams means in Cockney slang? In Cockney slang. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it is it like rhyming slang? Like it actually means wooden beams, which were a common architectural <laughs> feature at the time. <laughs> I know, but that's a great, as great a guess as any. He describes dreams as... Visits paid by the stomach to the brain by deputation of fume and consequent impregnation of folly. Those impressions being related shows the fool or being acted upon evinceth the dupe. Meaning what? So then he goes on to say a dreamer wide awake is he who takes impressions from the stomach and may be said to follow beef or be led by the nose culinarily. (laughs) So it's basically somebody whose eyes are bigger than their stomach. Our ha- wow. is having dreams. Gosh, that's so funny. Visits paid by the stomach to the brain. <laughs> so just thinking with your stomach rather than with your head. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Your last one, Emily, is a la mode. A la mode just means with ice cream. Uh, it does not. Yes, not it in does. Cockney, not in Cockney slang. Oh, I, all right. The first part of the definition is, without further explanation, beef is to be understood. As in... <laughs> As in, the term is beef a la mode, but they only talk about a la mode. Right. They're like, we're going to assume you know what beef is. Yeah. So what might um, beef a la mode, what you might a Cockney person describe someone else as beef a la mode? A person is yes. beef a la mode? <laughs> yes. So if they are beef a la mode, so I mean, beef means like, like conflict if you got beef with someone so if you've got beef a la mode with someone <laughs> it's it's just it's got it it's so complicated you've got all the bells and whistles going on you know there's like all these twists and turns in the relationship and it's just all going downhill emily that's lovely um really poetic <laughs> very wrong thanks <laughs> a la mode means simply showy and Frenchified. And Frenchified. <laughs> yep. He says, Clods and stockings, stewed to rags and seasoned high, tis used in throwing off against a person's dress, talk, etc. Some folks are all a la mode today, is the reference that he gives. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> Emily, this is a, a, a little bonus one, and we're going to use right. this to close off the episode. Perfect. Do you know what a word pecker is, Emily? A word pecker? Why, Kyle, that is you and me. <laughs> Literally, truly, it's you and me. John B. describes a word pecker as a critic upon words, a punster, or one that plays with words. And he says, the author of this volume is one for certain. Oh, that's so Isn't cute. Isn't that cute? <laughs> yeah, and I think we're word peckers as well, Emily. Oh, uh, wow. Well, listen, everybody out there, these are two word peckers signing off for now, but you can find more of our word pecking all over the internet. We've got a Facebook page that you can join. We've got yep. an Instagram at Butter No Parsnips Podcast. That's right. We've got a Patreon if you're willing to contribute to our word pecking. You can get episodes of the podcast early. You can also get episodes of our exclusive Patreon podcast, Buttered Parsnips. It is more than Ooh. butter on a plate, I can tell you. It is more than just plate of butter. <laughs> and thank you guys for listening. If you're interested in more word peckery, tune in next Monday and we'll have some more words for you. Absolutely.
Thank you for listening to Butternut Parsnips. Butternut Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and Kyle Imperator. The theme music and additional music is by Kyle Imperator. If you liked listening to this episode, subscribe and give us a good rating and or positive review wherever you heard it. If you really liked listening, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. There you can get bonus content you can't get anywhere else, like the monthly Patreon-exclusive podcast Buttered Parsnips. Your support means the world to us and encourages us to keep making more. Thanks in advance, and we'll be back next week.